<laughs> so my name is Sam Babiak and I'm the program director and member services director for the Writers League of Texas. Thank you so much for joining us today for Ask Us Anything What We're Reading Now with special guest Amy Gentry. So before we get started, we have a few announcements. Um, next week, we have three upcoming classes. The first is Stir Things Up, Creating Conflict in Fiction with Brian Yansky, and that's on Tuesday, May 5th, and registration closes that same day at 5 p.m. Um, the next class is on Wednesday, May 6th with Brita Jensen, and she'll be teaching multi-genre world building, crafting an emotional and physical landscape. And the last class for next week is Revisions Are Like Onions, Peeling Apart Your Manuscript One Layer at a Time with PJ Hoover. And that's on Saturday, May 9th. And registration closes this Friday at 5 p.m. Okay. Next Friday, right? Next Friday. Yes, next Friday, not tomorrow. <laughs> it feels like a Friday. <laughs> it does. <laughs> um, and so we once again partnered with Book People for this event. Um, and so we'll be sending you a list of all of the books we're recommending today. And yeah, support indie bookstores. Yay. On Saturday, we have a really exciting event coming up one page salon and a bookwoman fundraiser. And so all proceeds are going to go to bookwoman, um, but it is a free event. So there's only a suggested donation of $10, I believe. And that'll be hosted by Owen Edgerton with Amy Gentry, um, featuring Mary Pauline Lowry, Lisa Olstein, Richard Santos, Deb Olin Unfrith, and Amanda Air Ward. And they'll all be reading a page of unpublished or in progress work. Most fun time ever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's honestly one of like my favorite events. That we do. <laughs> if you've never been to a one page salon, it's, it is like one of the funnest literary events in Austin. No shade on any Writers League events, but there's a lot <laughs> more drinking and joke and like comedy <laughs> involved with the one page salon usually. That's what we've been weaseling our way into the one page salon slowly <laughs> but surely because we, we love. We love it. It's so much fun. And this one will be the first one that Owen's doing um, virtually. So it's going to be kicking off a whole new chapter <laughs> in the one page world. So yeah. And then um, next Thursday, join us for Houston Tells It Slant Motherhood. Um, and this will be a reading with readers Erin Bailu, Deborah Deep Mouton, and Jessica Wilbanks. And that is also free, but all proceeds will go to Project Row House. Um, and there's a suggested donation of $5 for this event. Cool. We have a podcast. If you're looking for more content, um, just search for Writers League of Texas in any streaming service that you use. Um, and we also have a YouTube channel where we're uploading all of these live events, as well as some other craft presentations with some authors that we love. Um, so you can check that out on our YouTube channel. Okay. All right. Um, and I'll just say hello. Hi, guys. My name is Becca Oliver. I'm the executive director at the Writers League of Texas. And first, I just want to thank you all for being here. We, we started this online virtual, we've been doing online programming for a while, but we started these live webinars, these free events, uh, shortly after we started working from home. And I think the very first Ask Us Anything we did was this topic, what we're reading now. And we just thought it would be nice for everybody to have a chance to come together. We would share books that we as a staff are reading and that we're excited about. And then we, we, we would also welcome folks to write in and tell us what they've been reading. And so we got some responses from all of you not all of you actually that is very untrue we got some responses for some of you and so we've created some slides that will highlight other books throughout so as we each progress through what we're recommending we may have a few books that you guys have mentioned that we'll talk about as well and we'll share what you had to say about them we also this time asked you what you were doing besides reading to kind of make these days pass by a little easier. And so we're gonna bring up some slides that will just give folks other ideas for ways to pass the time. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. And we have, we're so lucky to have our special guest with us who I, we're, we're thrilled to be able to say, I'm thrilled to be able to say, I would recommend either of her novels to all of you to be reading right now, but she is, such a huge supporter of other writers, um, especially, and I think that 
She's going to give you so many books that you're going to want to read that you are going to order all of them. That might be my dog, Daisy, kind of growling. Just ignore that. <laughs> um, that you're going to want to order them all from whether it's Book Woman or Book People or any of your, your indie bookstores. So I'm going to jump off and go first to just sort of um, get me out of the way. <laughs> and then we're going to move on to our guest, Amy Gentry. Um, and, and for sure, guys, in the chat box, you know, two things. Just remember that if you're writing to us, please write to all panelists and attendees so that we everybody gets to see the great um, suggestions you're making and the great books that you're talking about, the comments. But also, um, you are more than welcome to, uh, you know, start commenting on any of the books that we're talking about as well in the chat box. So. And we'll, we'll comment as well, us talking heads. So I just wanted to mention three books. The first one is a callback to the last time we did this, the Robert Galbraith, Lethal White, because this series, which I picked up the first book for it, it was called Cuckoo's Calling, when it first published several years ago at this point, um, and loved it. It's a, it's a private investigator series set in London. The main character is just absolutely um, intriguing and interesting. He's a curmudgeon. He's a, he's a guy who, you know, no matter what gets to the bottom of things, but there's a lot of wit and humor to, to everything about what um, the stories, but also he has a great sidekick in his um, office mate Robin, but this series was actually written by J.K. Rowling. So she wrote it under the name Robert Galbraith, and then quickly people discovered that Robert Galbraith did not exist, and it was J.K. Rowling. And I just think it's a really great series. So somebody mentioned it the last time we did this, and I realized that I hadn't read these books in a while, and that I was missing at least one of them. So I went back and picked up Lethal White, and I just finished it yesterday. So I, I you're looking for a series that you can get lost in if you like British fiction, if you like to um, do the private detective stuff, then I would absolutely recommend Robert Galbraith. Have you read these, Amy? I'm just curious. I don't know. I read, um, I, I read some of the casual vacancy. No, no, that's her adult novel. That's her adult novel. No, I've never read any Galbraith, actually. Yeah. yeah. I've okay. never dipped a toe in it. All right. Well, maybe you will. I would love um, to. It's been on my list for a long time, yeah. What did you think of the casual vacancy? Do you care to say? Oh, I really, I like it. I mean, I, I like it. I've, I, I've always enjoyed her writing, but it's never been my favorite, favorite writing. Like I read all the Harry Potter books. Like I, I could, I think I just got interrupted with casual vacancy. It wasn't like I threw it down in disgust or anything. And I ended up watching the series afterward and then feeling like, well, now I know what happened. I, <laughs> I don't, I, I just like, it put me off reading, go back, going back and reading the book. But I like loved all the themes and I thought it was super interesting, but it just wasn't like, at the, she's just so readable, you know, but she's yeah. just never like, but she's never like the first thing that I reach for basically. Yeah. I didn't read the casual vacancy because I had heard sort of mixed reviews about it and I don't know, but I didn't read it. So I can't speak to that. And so when this series came along, and I knew who sh who was writing it when I picked up the first book. I was just really um, pleasantly surprised. I've always been more interested in the Galbraith ones because I feel like I would like them better because they're the darkest, right? I mean, they're really crime novels, and that's yeah. kind of my thing. I think yeah. the you know the Casual Vacancy is crime-ish, but it's it's still got that soft like kind of case to it. Yeah. yeah, got it. Um, so the other book I wanted to mention is Normal People by Sally Rooney, and I, I wanted to mention this for a couple reasons, but the main one being that, I don't know about you guys, but I had a really hard time focusing on reading when all of this started, and I, you know, I love to spend my time reading, but I just was finding that every time I picked up a book, I wasn't, I wasn't able to really get lost in it. And I wasn't finding something that I couldn't put down. And it was frustrating. And this novel, I'm not going to say that I couldn't put it down <laughs> because it's 273 pages and it took me a month to read it, which felt outrageous. But it's, but it's so different from everything that I'm, you know, that we're experiencing right now. It's so, um, it's so different from, uh, you know, 
anything that I've read recently, and it's set in Ireland. It's a story of two young people who meet in high school, the equivalent, Irish equivalent of high school, and they um, just become a part of each other's lives for, you know, many, many years after, in and out of a relationship, but also just they're each sort of that other person for each other, whether for good or for bad. And I just found that um, it was exactly what I needed to get back into my reading groove. And so when I finished that book, I was really able to pick up the next book and read it in a couple of days. Like it was exactly what I needed to jumpstart me again. So, and then Sally Rooney, I would just say as somebody who's gotten a lot of attention, I, um, don't love the fact that she's barely 30 years old and she's already won a ton of awards and she's publishing now this was her second novel but you know that's pretty admirable and she's going to be someone who's going to be around for a long time so if you're looking to discover a new literary novelist that you maybe haven't read before she's she's a good one to pick up so okay. the tv show also just came out is it out now i think the first episode is <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, I did see something about that. I read Normal People too, and I really, I had the same experience where it was just like, man, it, it went down so easy, mm -hmm. and it was so interesting, but not so, not like, you know, troubling deeply. I mean, it, it just was like, it was kind of a palate cleanser. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, like not frivolous, but not, it wasn't um, but it's not like some heavy stuff in it. Actually. Right. But it just kind of, something about the way it's written, it just feels like they're your friends and you're hanging out with them and everyone knows each other and yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, so so Sally Rooney. Um, and then the last book I wanted to mention, and this is also sort of remembering the last conversation we had, which was how important poetry is right now to a lot of people and that a lot of folks are going to that shelf and you know finding what, um, inspiration and sort of um, solace and all sorts of other amazing things from poetry. So I have a big shelf of poetry. I love it. I wish that I read it more often, but I did go back to it a lot in the last month. And the book that I want to recommend from that shelf is Tracy K. Smith, um, Life on Mars. She was the Poet Laureate of the U.S. in 2017 and is just beautiful, beautiful writer. But what I love about this book, which I have here, um, is that it actually is very, it, it feels, I feel very connected to it in that it won the Pulitzer. So obviously, no, I'm just kidding. That's not why I'm connected to it, but it did win the Pulitzer. Um, I feel connected to it because she's about a year and a half older than me. Her dad was an engineer who worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and my dad was an astronomer who, who also worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. Wow. And she talks about, and her father passed away not too long ago, I think around the time she was really writing a lot of the poems that are in this book. And so there's a lot of managing grief in it, but it's not, but there's also such a beautiful lightness to it. And she talks about uh, the future in a way that feels um, interesting and she is just there's there's melancholy there's kind of what you want when you know for me in the last few weeks I've thought about my dad a lot and I've thought about and I imagine many of you have people that are not in your life anymore and you're thinking like what would they be saying about what's going on right now? How would I talk with them about what's happening right now? And so um, it was really comforting to read this collection again and remember how much I love it. Um, so I was actually going to read, if you don't mind, just a short, um, a short piece of one of the poems from this book. It's a long, it's probably the most well-known book from the poem from the book. It's called, My God, It's Full of Stars, which I believe is the first line of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Is that right? Oh. Or is it the last line? It's like, I think it's the first line. But it's a very long, it's a long poem. It has five parts, but I was just gonna read you the last little bit of it. It's my first live reading ever, guys. I'm very excited. <laughs> okay, thanks for indulging me. When my father worked on the Hubble telescope, he said they operated like surgeons scrubbed and sheathed in papery green, the room a clean cold and bright white. 
He'd read Larry Niven at home and drink scotch on the rocks, his eyes exhausted and pink. These were the Reagan years when we lived with our finger on the button and struggled to view our enemies as children. My father spent whole seasons bowing before the oracle eye, hungry for what it would find. His face lit up whenever anyone asked and his arms would rise as if he were weightless, perfectly at ease in the never ending night of space. On the ground, we tied postcards to balloons for peace. Prince Charles married Lady Di, Rock Hudson died. We learned new words for things, the decade changed. The first few pictures came back blurred and I felt ashamed for all the cheerful engineers, my father and his tribe. The second time, the optics jived. We saw to the edge of all there is. So brutal and alive, it seemed to comprehend us back. Mm. <laughs> She's awesome. She's amazing. I can't recommend her enough. So I hope you guys will check out Tracy K. Smith. And that was my bit. <laughs> I, love, I love that last line. That's a killer. I love right. it. To the edge of everything, right? So we we wanted to start telling you, you know, we wanted to share some of the stuff that you guys sent back to us. This is, of course, a, a local author, Amanda Air Ward, but also a hugely successful novelist that we're so proud to call um, one of our own here in Austin. So Stacy S, I almost said her, her last name, um, said that this was The Jet Setters by Amanda Air Ward is often laugh out loud funny with its depiction of the most crude Cruise shippy of cruise ships, the perfectly named Splendido Marvaluso. But alongside, the comedy is a vivid depiction of the ways childhood trauma shapes us into adulthood and how family can both be the most frustrating and the most uplifting thing in our lives. By the end of the novel, I was cheering for each member of the Perkins family as they stumbled their way toward into new relationships with each other. So the Jet Setters, um, another another person who wrote us also recommended the Jet Setters. So I hope you guys will check it out. And Amanda's going to be reading at our one page salon on Saturday night. So if you're a fan of Amanda's or you just want to get to know her a little bit better, show up on Saturday for sure. And then somebody else, Lindsay C, is reading the Poets and Writers Complete Guide to Being a Writer. Everything you need to know about craft, inspiration, agents, editors, publishing, and the business of building a sustainable writing career. That's a lot in one book, guys. <laughs> uh, and Lindsay says it reads like the greatest hits of the magazine, which is a good thing. And she's been loving it so far. So check that out. And then Educated by Tara Westover. Emily C. is reading this. The author has created a page turner of a memoir. Her story is compelling, but her prose makes it a fascinating and compulsive read. Given my own attempts at authoring fiction, I am willing to learn from any source whatsoever. For that reason, I am not just reading her work, I'm studying it to learn how she did it. Which I think is such a great thing to remember that you know, as readers, we're also, I think, often wanting to look at the craft and how somebody put something together so that we can then use that in our own writing in whatever way it might feel, you know, organic or natural. And I love this book. I didn't, I didn't read the book, the print book. I listened to the audio and it was so well done and just, um, yeah, not, not able to put it down. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I recommend Educated as well. The Republic of Jack. With, <laughs> with my concentration now diluted, ID, ID says, this was an easy read. Set in Austin, witty, ironic, and entertaining by Austin's own Dr. Jeff Kerr. So another, another local writer. I have no idea what this book is about, but I'm interested just based on my cover. And then ID also wanted to recommend three other books. She didn't... Um, uh, mentioned anything specific about them, but I know she was enjoying them and wanted to make sure that we mentioned them as well. So again, The Jet Setters, Trust Me by Richard Santos, who may be here tonight. I'm not sure if he is, but he's also going to be at the One Page Salon um, on Saturday. And then Ways to Disappear is the third book um, by Idra Novi that Idi mentioned. All fan favorites. And then finally, here's a couple of the tips that we got from people about ways to pass the time. 
talking the street in front of my house with games, riddles, and silly drawings for the neighborhood children, which I have to say, there's a street that I take the dog walking on every day, and someone has been chalking the heck out of it, and it makes me really happy every time I walk by it. Um, and then walking the dogs in the fields, which sounds just so lovely to me. So um, yeah, there we go. Passing it over now to our special guest star, um, who I hope, Amy, will you introduce yourself to everyone for um, just a moment and tell them a little bit more about you and, the, and your books, your life as a writer, and then we're gonna jump into all these great recommendations. Sure. Um, hi everyone, and hi Becca, and thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to do this. As I told Becca, the only thing I like to do is just shove recommendations on people. So this is basically my dream event. Uh, <laughs> I am a, a writer in Austin. Um, I write um, psychological suspense and crime books and the occasional odd nonfiction book here and there. Um, my books are Good Is Gone, that was my first book, and Last Woman Standing. Um, they have, they tend to have, at least so far, they have female narrators, um, usually lots of twists, think Gone Girl, Girl in a Train, Girl doing this and that, <laughs> um, <laughs> Girl murdering someone, um, that's kind of, you're starting to get the idea. Um, and my third book actually is now has a publication date as of like this week. It's actually available even for pre-order, which is Oh my goodness, out. tell us all about it. Yeah, it's called Bad Habits. And it, and it's about, it's another suspense uh, thriller. And um, it is about a um, young woman who uh has kind of a troubled family background um but she meets a best friend who's from a more privileged background and she ends up kind of turning her life around in high school and getting into college and eventually a really good graduate program and they end up at graduate school together and that's when everything goes terribly 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 wrong so it's a thriller it's a it's a thriller set in grad school um with all the toxic uh, <laughs> vibes that entails. Um, and it should be really, I am hoping it will be for other people. It is for me very juicy and <laughs> a little bit racier than other stuff I've written. Ooh. So I'm really hoping I'll enjoy it. It's kind of a, I've been telling people it's like um, Tom Ripley from um, The Talented Mr. Ripley mm -hmm. meets the prime of Miss Jean Brody. Uh, <laughs> if you know the Muriel Spark book. So. Yeah, yeah. I want to say really quick that your first novel and all both of your books, because I've read them both, but I just think that your debut especially was so not surprising. It was surprising in the way that it was so, so I had no idea what the answer to that big question that you get at the start of that book, is she or is she not? I had no idea through the entire thing and it was so well done. And so, and if you guys are looking for a way to study a thriller and kind of see a really unique way to craft it as well. I mean, that book is one that I recommend to people all of the time. And then last, last woman standing is just such a, an amazing, you know, concept that I um, sort of revenge, revenge thriller, which was, is perfect. So yeah, Amy, check out Amy's books for sure, guys. Thanks, Becca. That's really nice. <laughs> um, well, let's move on to other people's books. Um, so uh, I, Becca, when you talk about not being able to concentrate at the beginning, especially, um, I had the same thing. I think a lot of people did. Um, and what ended up breaking me out of it was actually um, a, a horror novel a new horror novel um, called The Return by Rachel Harrison. Mm -hmm. um, now I, I picked this up, it was, a, it was actually kind of highly anticipated in like the thriller world. Um, and uh, it was like, a, it was kind of pitched as a thriller with supernatural elements. 
Um, and then it came out in late March, March 24th to be exact. And it just felt like it was before anybody knew how to have like a book tour online. It was when we were all still struggling and coping and it really kind of, I think fell through the cracks a little bit with, you know, despite like the great publicity it had gotten. Um, but I had the arc fortunately still, and I, I, could not put this book down. I sat up in bed reading chapter after chapter. I was scared. <laughs> I laughed. It's also very funny. Um, so I'll describe the premise to you, um, get to the good part. So this is about uh, four friends from college, four female friends. Um, one of them disappears shortly after college. She's gone for a couple of years and they, and she was in a state park camping. So there, the assumption is that somehow or other she she died people die in state parks or in federal parks and uh you know they they're moving on they're trying to move on and she comes back just a couple of years later but just long enough to kind of have changed everyone's feelings and when she comes back it's not a spoiler i think to say she comes back different Okay, so it's one of those books. Already you kind of sense if you've seen any kind of horror movies or even read The Monkey's Paw or something like that, you probably have a sense for how she might be different in some ways, especially knowing that it's a horror novel. But what's really great about this book is the way this all unfolds is they decide to go on a girl's trip, like a girl's weekend to reunite the gang. And part of what makes it so great is that they've they've already been kind of splitting apart just from life things. Their group has different socioeconomic levels, different marital statuses, and they're kind of in that phase where people are already having a lot of trouble, you know, in their late 20s, kind of knowing who they are and whether they still belong together as friends, and they're just not letting go. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's already really problematic. And then you throw in what turns out to be a supernatural horror story <laughs> and um it's just like it's it's funny because they're still they're in this wacky hotel this boutique hotel and they're like doing their activities together they're doing like flower arranging classes and like all these kind of bridesmaid type um things together but like one of them is clearly not okay and they're all just like should we say anything um so it's kind of a com it's a great combination of funny and truly terrifying as i said i read um a lot of thrillers and i'm very rarely scared by something i read and i was like <laughs> um reading ahead the chapters are also really short and it's just a really like easy read too so i highly recommend it even the climax of this was emotionally really moving to me and if you've ever had friends that you fell out of touch with or drifted apart from or feared that you would i think you'll also enjoy this book um so the return rachel harrison thank you uh, <laughs> Yeah, and I, I realized as I was putting this list together that, um, that I, I maybe it's just because of my crime writer personality or something, I don't know, but I found myself, you know, getting a lot of recommendations for like upbeat and light books, and I understand why those are really comforting, but after the first initial, as I said, after I kind of like got in with this, um, an unput downable read, I kind of realized that for me, the key was having a book that was gripping enough and sort of maybe suspenseful and a little bit dark um, to, so that I wouldn't feel jealous. <laughs> like, I mean, I don't want to read about people having fun right now. <laughs> right, right, and shaking hands and like touching each other. <laughs> I, I always love a nasty dark read anyway, and I think the key for me was finding something that touched on feelings I was having, but in like a different milieu, sure. and kind of giving me a way to think about metaphors of feeling trapped or missing friends or something like that that you know in an exciting read that was maybe a little twisted because that's what i like um so in in that um vein just to bring up the next one this is another um arc that i got before the the quarantine and um ended up reading 
it, it actually just came out on April 7th. Um, this, uh, but yeah, I ended up reading it right at the beginning of the quarantine too. This is called Sin Eater. <laughs> it's another debut, So Is the Return by Megan Campisi. This one is, I, I just, I've been recommending it to everyone who likes Shakespeare, everyone who's a little bit gothy or likes historical fiction, everyone who likes The Handmaid's Tale or all his alternate histories as well. It's a weird and hard to classify book. Um, but she is a actually a, an award-winning playwright and this is her first novel. And a Sin Eater is actually a real thing um, in, I think I'm gonna botch the era, but in like, I don't know, Renaissance era, maybe, um, does somebody else know this and it's not in Kelsey, <laughs> um, Renaissance era, England. Um, so a sin eater sits by the grave of the recently deceased and eats bread and that in doing so eats their sins so that they can go to their maker without, without sin. And it's a really fascinating job to imagine. <laughs> like, who are these sin eaters? <laughs> And um, Megan Campisi kind of heard about, got the idea for this story from hearing about real Sin Eaters, um, which is like this a, sort of a folkloric type of practice that survived pretty late into like the 19th century. Um, and she wrote, kind of constructed a whole world around that idea. So that Sin Eaters in this book, it's, it's set in that like, kind of Renaissance era England, but it, uh, but it's, um, but it's an alt, it's an alternate history. So it's not real, it's fantasy, I guess you could call it. Um, and in this world, like every village has their sin eater and the sin eater is kind of this ultimate pariah, um, kind of the scapegoat of the village. And they um, they go to they go to the um, they're called to sick beds to hear confessions so that they know what foods go with each sin, yeah. and so that they can request the the foods to be laid out on the coffin. And then when the person dies, they go and eat the sins. And it's just that I feel like I'm not describing even half. I mean, this <laughs> it's about a young woman who becomes a sin eater, like not through her own um, volition. She's sentenced to becoming a, a sin eater and she is a, for stealing bread of all things. And she's apprenticed to the village sin eater. And it's just like she gets sucked into all this intrigue because a sin eater goes, oh, it's a, such a great concept. Yeah, Honestly, I love it. The, the premise alone is just so powerful. Um, I wouldn't say it's a perfect book. I think in the last half, she gets into this very plot, like twisty palace intrigue plot that you're, was kind of like a little bit less interesting to me, but the premise is so good and the world is so well realized that I just felt like I kind of fell in love with it and I wanted more people to read it. Um, so yeah, Sin Eater by Megan Campisi. And I, I thought I could read just the first paragraph, of, not even the whole first paragraph, just a couple yep. of sentences to give you a taste for her prose, which is really, really great. Um, I mean, not maybe not like the fastest read because it's more rich, but um, you'll see. No. <clears throat> Salt for pride, mustard seed for lies, barley for curses. There are grapes too laid red and bursting across the pinewood coffin. One grape split with ruby seeds poking through the skin like a sliver through flesh. There's crow's meat stewed with plums and a homemade loaf, small and shaped like a bobbin. Why a loaf in such a shape, I think, and why so small? There are other foods too, but not many. My mother had few sins. Oh, that's so great. <laughs> oh, no. So yeah, it's a little taste. Oh. Sold, Amy. Sold. Okay. <laughs> um, and when, should I do, maybe like split these up and kind of do like one more and then kind of pass to some other folks and then come back or how? It's up to you. We have you back to back. So you're welcome to keep going. Yeah. Do it. How system. long people can take listening to me. It yeah. feels really weird. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to split it up, we can also do that. That's totally up to you. I'll do, I'll do, um, I'll do a couple more. I might not do all of the ones that I said, because I think I overloaded you. <laughs> well, I'm excited. 
like, I think that even if you want to give a flavor of a couple of them and you want to go into more detail on, you know, one or two more, that's totally up to you. That's fine. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So one that I um, also finally got around to reading after having purchased it before quarantine and just turned out to be um, amazing was this one. Has anyone read Drive Your Plow? Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead is the full title. It's no. sideways. Here. Why do I know that author's name, though? What did she write? Well, she won the Nobel Prize. Oh. <laughs> so there's that. Of course. I make it a habit to memorize all the Nobel Prize winners' names. So that I do sense. not. I do not. <laughs> but um, but she, she also wrote Flights, which um, just a couple of years ago, which was also hugely acclaimed. And I'm, I'm going to buy that one and read it. Okay. Um, but this, I think, is her most recent one. It won both the Man Booker International Prize and she then she won the Nobel Prize as well. So, yeah, there you go. Okay. Oh, Kelsey, I hope you tell us about that one. Because um, I'm really curious. This one, I started it in, uh, before the quarantine, and I didn't get more than a couple of pages in because it has some unusual... Actually, it's just capitalization. That's it. It's a little bit unorthodox. Like some nouns are capitalized. And at first, when you're reading it, you're not sure why. And you're kind of, I was like, oh, this seems kind of intellectual for me. <laughs> I just didn't want to deal with it right then. But when I came back to it in quarantine at a friend's recommendation, I found that actually, if you, you get used to that pretty quickly, and it is absolutely not an indication that we're in some kind of abstract world. Um, it's a very concrete kind of, I would say mystery or crime novel, but, but you kind of, it, the crime is not necessarily the point. Um, it's narrated by, from this point of view of this old woman who lives alone in this extremely cold climate on the border of Poland and Czech. Republic, is that right? Uh, <laughs> um, does that sound geographically possible? Okay, <laughs> I just got nervous for a second. Um, she lives just inside Poland, um, the in the Polish border, and um, and and it's this extremely desolate kind of wintry landscape where she's snowed in all winter, taking care of the neighboring houses of like the summer cottages that have been abandoned, and she has the most fascinating voice. She's funny she's really angry about everything and she's learned and um she's just like <laughs> it's very hard to describe her because she's so particular and so winning you you she's kind of belligerently like she doesn't she's sort of misanthropic but you find yourself just so seduced by her voice that you're like totally on her side even when she's being completely unreasonable. And the book really relies on that without giving too much away. The book really relies on you being 100% on her side, even when things start going extremely awry, um, as they quickly do when a dead body is found mm -hmm. in the neighboring cabin. So I think that's all I'm going to say about it. But I can't recommend this book highly enough. It's it's a murder mystery that's also a philosophical and deeply moving and poetic text. And um, I just loved every page of it. Cool. And it's a literary, I would call it a more literary read than the other two that I recommended, but just as direct and accessible, I would say. Um, so I really only have, I only have one more in hard copy. So maybe okay. I will just talk about that one really quickly yeah. and then we'll move on to someone else. Is that okay? It's hard without an audience to tell if anybody is there asleep or whatever. I think, um, I mean, we're all awake. I would say talk about the next one that you want to talk about. And then if you want to like touch on all the other ones that we have these jackets for, I'd love to hear at least. Oh, you, you have them. Them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Are you yeah, flying them up? Oh. Yeah, it's on the shared screen. You can't oh, see. Oh, see, I, I, oh, there they are! Oh my god, they're right there. They were there all along. Amy Gentry, meet Zoom. <laughs> yeah, they were there all along. So we have Hex Transit, and then we had another okay. book on the other slide. So okay, well, the one I was going to talk about. Uh, oh yeah, so those are. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right, Timber. Okay. <laughs> helpful to have a reference. Thanks, guys. 
<laughs> we're a real class act here act here at the uh, Writers League of Texas yeah <laughs> All right. well I'll go into uh, I'll read a tiny bit of this one and talk about it more too and then I'll just kind of touch on the other ones in one sentence or less okay. uh, all right so this one I actually started just today so when you asked about like what are you reading during quarantine this came to me um, from book woman just a couple days ago and I I read, I like inhaled a quarter of it in like no time flat. Um, it's called Breasts and Eggs by Mieko Kawakami, who is a big and rising star in um, Japanese literature. Um, and she's been blurbed by Murakami, if you're a fan of Murakami. Um, she's just, this is kind of her first um, big book to be published in, in English, to be translated. Um, and I just kind of took a wild, like, uh, gander at it, at knowing like almost nothing about it except the crazy title, Breasts and Eggs. <laughs> and I am just fascinated by it. I just can't quite wrap my brain around it yet, because I am not done. But it's, one thing I love about it is it's extremely accessibly written. It's um, almost reminds me of Elena Ferrante or other like auto fiction. It, it, I don't think it is auto fiction, but it feels like it because it just feels like someone talking to you about their life. Um, the narrator, um, oh, I can't remember the narrator's name. The narrator's name is Natsuko. And it's about her relationship with her older sister, Makiko, who comes to visit her with her daughter, um, Natsuko's niece, Midoriko. And it's really, so far, it's just, it's just the, the two sisters and the niece kind of just getting reacquainted, walking around, but more and more kind of troubling things emerge. First of all, they had a difficult childhood, and so we learn about that. The sister is actually in town to get breast implants. Um, the sister works at a, a bar in Osaka and is not very well and maybe it's it seems like is not having a great life there and has become obsessed with getting breast implants and so she's visiting with her 12 year old daughter and the 12 year old daughter has not spoken a word to her mother in six months she just stopped talking to her and only communicates through writing and, um, and which again, like it sounds really dark and it kind of is, <laughs> but it's also um, the way it's written is just so matter of fact. And the, the niece character, is, you get access to her internal monologue through journal entries. And she's kind of, we, we still don't know why she hasn't, um, and why she doesn't talk at this point in the novel, but it's clear that like she's hitting puberty, she's really freaked out by it, she's really upset by the idea of basically becoming a woman and having the same kind of life that her mother and aunt and grandmother <laughs> all had. Like all the women in her life have had these very difficult lives, and um, and the first uh, the first paragraph of it kind of communicates. It gives you a little taste of the conversational tone of the book and also communicates some of the themes. Um, but, uh, but it's, I, I would say like the overarching theme as the, um, as the title would suggest is just kind of what it means to be a woman in the world and a woman in Japan particularly um, and, and not a wealthy woman either. Um, it's a really class conscious novel. Um, and it occasionally has these weird breaks from into this like surreal mode that only lasts for a second and then it goes back to normal and you kind of, at least right now, I don't know what's going on. Maybe it'll explain it later. Um, so the first page, the, fir uh, the, fir the title of the first chapter is Are You Poor? <laughs> and <Wow. laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the first paragraph is if you want to know how poor somebody was growing up, ask them how many windows they had. Don't ask what was in their fridge or in their closet. The number of windows says it all. It says everything. If they had none or maybe one or two, that's all you need to know. So that kind of gives you just the tiniest taste of how, you know, it's very simple language. It's very direct. It can almost feel a little repetitive at times even, but it just sounds like somebody it just talking to you. And it's surprisingly immersive in the way that I think like um, 
uh, Ferrante and maybe Kanawa's Guard and some of these other like auto fiction writers are. So that's, I'm just devouring it and I'll check back in Becca and tell you how, yeah. <laughs> how it ends. I love the jacket and it's, and it's published by Ferrante's publisher too. Yeah, yeah, Europa, yeah. And they're publishing two more of her novels like in the coming years. I think they're translating them right now. So yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated, Kelsey, to know if you've read any of these because you've been, you've been nodding <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I, I haven't yet, but I am so enthralled and so excited to. I, like, I'm like, I'm sold. I'm going to buy all these books. We'll right talk. <laughs> All right, so give us the quick okay. hits on okay. Transit and Hex. Yeah, Transit is the second, um, the second in the Outline Trilogy by Rachel Cusk, and I read the first a long time ago and just liked it fine, but didn't feel like I had to rush out. They can be read in any order, though, and when I picked up Transit just a couple weeks ago, I felt like it was the perfect quarantine read. For me something about the prose is beautiful and delicious um it <laughs> uh it's about her moving into purchasing and moving into and like renovating a house in london after she's lived elsewhere for a long time and she's kind of coming back to the city and it has a very curious and somewhat ingenious combination of a feeling of expansive freedom that you always get with Rachel Cusk's internal monologue. You just get the feeling that her brain is just a beautiful and spacious place where there's room for um, so much um, fascinating connections and description. And also it feels somewhat claustrophobic because there are these neighbors that live below downstairs in this like London kind of in this building. They, they have the upper half of the building and the neighbors who live down below, it turns out are why they were able to get the house so cheaply. And so as they're trying to renovate, they're kind of beleaguered and besieged. Uh, she's kind of being hectored all the time by these sort of gnomes that live underground. <laughs> um, so it's just, it's kind of got that darkness that I like, but it's much more um, it's just beautifully written and it's not a horror story. It won't scare you. Um, but yeah, I just, I loved every page. I want to go back and read it again, like next oh, week. Cool. Awesome. Um, Hex is a weird book that it's an, maybe only I would love, <laughs> but it's about academics. <laughs> it's, it's about grad, a grad student who is already at the book's opening, had kind of a nervous breakdown and dropped out of her program after one of the, her coworkers, her co-grad students in the biology lab where they work dies of a poisoning incident that was directly related to their work. So they, they work with poisons in the lab and something happened, an accident happened, and the worker died. And so after that, she was sort of kicked out of her program in disgrace. And she's kind of in love with her former advisor. And the whole book is addressed to her former advisor from the depths of this nervous breakdown. So again, it's got that kind of claustrophobic energy, but it's an incredibly short book. And it's so funny that I, I, I can't even describe to you exactly how because her writing style is so quirky and weird but it was like it, it's the narrator is just kind of at rock bottom and she just kind of tells it straight at every moment and she her perceptions are extremely warped and funny um she's able to kind of see things that are uh I don't know, the emperor's new clothes type stuff. Uh, <laughs> so I really enjoyed that as an ex-academic as well with a novel coming out about academia. That one really thrilled me. And if you have any interest in poisons, especially she has whole chapters where she just lists poisons and talks about how they work and um, talks about her poison garden. So oh my gosh. And I think that's all. Oh, well, the one last one I won't go into detail is just a pot boiler by a friend of mine, um, Lane Fargo. It's called Temper, and it's I think it's on the other sheet. It just came out in paperbacks. 
so it's cheaper price point. And yeah, there it is, Temper. And it's set in the world of theater. It's kind of a Me Too thriller set in the world of like Chicago theater. And it was recently no noted in the New York Times as one of the top books to read if you're missing theater, like live theater. Oh, so if you're yeah. a theater person and the Sondheim things on the weekend like aren't enough for you. <laughs> um, yeah, the New York Times says pick up temper. I totally agree. It's sexy and steamy as well as being, you know, a pot boiler with a thriller plot. So enjoy okay. it. And it's all about Shakespeare. So. <laughs> Amy Gentry, what the heck? That was really great. Thank you so much. I hope you stick around as long as you want to, but these, I mean, these recommendations are amazing. And I know that Kelsey is going to loan Sam and I all of these books after she picks them up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. And we really appreciate you being here and so um, sharing your brilliance. And also just, you know, I want to give you a chance to, say a few words about Book Woman because that is going to be the focus of our fundraiser on Saturday night. And I would just love for you to be able to say, you know, why it is that we're really encouraging folks to show up for the one page for the most fun time ever, but also to donate some dollars. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Becca. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Book Woman is, um, I, I'm sure all of you know, but if you don't, it is um, a feminist bookstore in Austin. It's been around for 45 years, nearly half a century now. Um, and it is one of the last surviving feminist bookstores with a storefront in the United States and Canada. It really is. Um, so you, even if you've been there from time to time, you may not realize what a piece of Austin history and Central Texas history it is, and what an important resource it's been for um, for women and marginalized communities in, in the central Texas area for you know half a century. Um, so after since the quarantine, um, they've been having some, some difficulties with their landlord, um, which may or may not be resolved, but the gist of it is, like every other bookstore in town um, and, and store, they're suffering extremely and um, there's a really you know, we were a little bit scared <laughs> at the beginning of the quarantine that they might not come out of quarantine healthy and strong and surviving. So um, yeah, I first stepped into Book Woman in the 90s when I was a wee freshman or maybe sophomore in, <laughs> in, um, at UT. And um, it kind of like, I mean, in many ways, the books that I bought there changed my life. Um, they've just been around in Austin doing their job quietly for so long. So I um, I think we tend to take things like that for granted sometimes in Austin because it's such a weird, fun place. And if we've lived here a long time, we just think it'll always be like that. But we've seen enough things go by now to know that it is possible for things to disappear that we love. And Book Woman, um, again, just uh, one of like maybe three or four right now in the country bookstores um, devoted to their mission of helping women and um, LGBTQ and other marginalized communities to survive via um, all kinds of outreach that they do. Um, and they have a fabulous fiction selection and nonfiction. If you've ever been in that store, Susan curates the front table like a dream and you can, you the best way to shop there is to walk in not knowing what you want. Yeah. Um, but that said, you can order anything through Book Woman and they are open right now for curbside delivery service with masks and all that good stuff. So yeah. that's my spiel. Oh, <laughs> I we see you on a Saturday. It's a treasure and it's worth, and, and you know, just to make sure people know for the one page salons, we're going to be um, raising money for different organizations and entities every time. And we were so excited to start with Book Woman because they, they could use our help and they have been giving so much to us for so many years. So um, Amy, before we move on, we have a question for you, which is how many books do you read per month and how many hours do you spend reading versus writing? Mm, that's a, the second one, especially is like very good questions. Very sneaky. question. <laughs> um, the first one varies a whole lot. And honestly, I, I have to read a lot of books sort of for work. So I, you know, I, I read a lot of thrillers and 
kind of as research and just to keep abreast. Um, so I'm never sure whether to count those or not as pleasure reading because they're pleasurable, but they are for work and not quite my choice. <laughs> um, so I, I'm like, I, I don't know. I, it can, I think it varies between like maybe five and 10 a month, I would guess. Wow. But, you know, a number. It's a that number. <laughs> it, it might be less. Uh, I mean, some months it's definitely less. Like if I have a deadline, it's yeah. that. But I have found that even when I'm under a lot of strain with a deadline, I have to have something at night before I go to sleep. Mm -hmm. I just have to have something on my nightstand. Even if I can barely read it, I read like one page and fall asleep. I just have to have something. So I usually have something cooking, even if it's very slow. Mm -hmm. so, um, Thank you. The second one. Oh, how much reading and writing? I, um, I think the reading is part of the writing, and I know that you guys understand this as writers. It's um, I, I've just been telling myself this during quarantine that there's active time when you're sitting down and putting words on the page or revising or whatever, and then part of being a writer that you really can't do without is the time and space to have ideas and that is like reading is part of that for me and i'm sure for a lot of you too mm -hmm. um so you know when i read the um the the uh, rachel cusk book transit and whenever i read tessa hadley and some other books you know reading them will actually like do something to my brain that makes ideas come out <laughs> and so i yeah i mean I'm not sure what the actual breakdown is, but I don't, I kind of think of, especially the pleasure reading as kind of continuous with the process. Sometimes I just have to take a day and read. Um, otherwise the ideas will never come. So that's, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I love the way you describe that as sort of, I mean, in some ways what you're saying is you're, you're always writing, you know, whether it's just, you're thinking about it, you're reading, you're walking and thinking about writing. I mean, it's all like a part of that process ultimately, right? I, I, yeah, in the best of times. I mean, I think right now, like when I'm when I'm doing uh, looking after my son, who's a toddler, <laughs> I think that's like the only time I'm not really writing. I, I know that some parents can, like, but it's like my brain is just totally colonized and I don't really have ideas when I'm when I'm doing that kind of like emotional work mm -hmm. and so yeah and I and I think um yeah it's like the spaciousness of reading and the way it gives your brain just a place to expand and play mm -hmm. that's what feels like writerly about it and the fact that it's filtered through language really spurs you I think um, you know, and even these books like um, The Return, actually, I was going to say The Return really made me realize that I've been writing these thrillers, these psych thrillers, um, and I love suspense, but I really want to write a horror novel. And I, I never knew that really until I read The Return and went, oh, you can make a domestic thriller, but have it be a horror novel instead of you know, instead of a psych suspense. So anyway, yeah, look for that. Maybe in like five years, <laughs> this thing ever ends. It's not going to be about quarantine, I promise. I'm not going to write a quarantine. <laughs> Don't make any promises you might not be able to keep. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. And you're welcome. We hope you'll stick around. And if you hear us mention any books that you want to talk about, but we also know that if you have to hop off, we will not be offended at all. I'm looking at the time and I wanted, I actually really wanted to stay to hear Sam and Kelsey's recommendations, but I might have to come back, circle back around and, and hear them <laughs> later. But Of course. All right. Well, we're glad you were able to be here and we appreciate you so much. Thank you. And I'll see you on Saturday. We'll all see you on yeah, Saturday. Tonight. Absolutely. Okay. I'm gonna, I might sign into the chat and just like sneak a peek later. All right. Bye y'all. <laughs> bye bye. bye. <laughs> All right. Guys, Kelsey's up. <laughs> hey guys. Um my name's Kelsey. I'm the office manager for the Writers League. Um I'm also a writer myself. Um I'm an artist. Um and um Talking about books is one of my favorite things ever, so I'm really excited to do this. And Amy's energy was really infectious and wonderful. Um, and she's so cool and I love her. I don't know if she's still <laughs> here, but hi. Um, <laughs> um, cool, so I'll just go ahead and jump right in. Um, 
the first book I have to recommend is um, this one here. It's called The Book of X by Sarah Rose Eder. Um, and it is published by Two Dollar Radio, which is such an awesome little indie publisher based in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Um, and um, this was the first book that I read during this like shelter at home time, the quarantine time that we're in, and it was so interesting. Um, so it is a book. It's a novel um, that kind of takes place in the present day. It centers around um, a character named Cassie, who is a woman who has um, a knot in her middle. And that is literal. There's, there's actually a knot that's like in her torso where, you know, her stomach should be. And so that kind of tells you that it is more kind of a surreal read and yet so much of it is rooted in a kind of visceral realism so i really love books that have that beautiful juxtaposition um and i wanted to read just like a little bit of the first page just so you guys can get um a little bit of a feel i think it does actually a really good job of um, telling you what the book's about um so it begins I was born and not like my mother and her mother before her. Picture three women with their torsos twisted like th thick pieces of rope with a single hitch in the center. The doctors had the same reaction each birth. They lifted our slick warped bodies into the air and stared, horrified. All three of us wailed, strange new animals, our lineage gnarled, aching hardened. Outside, beyond the bright white lights of the hospital, the machine of the world kept grinding on. A metal mouth baring its teeth, a maw waiting to clench down on us. Um, so that's kind of, wow. the, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an intense book. It is very surreal and visceral and so stunning and so beautiful. I was just captivated the entire time and it kind of spans throughout the whole of Cassie's life. So what it was like to be a, a little girl, to a teenager, to um, adulthood. Um, and it's kind of about, it's kind of about pain. It's kind of about like womanhood. And it's about the like kind of, um, you know, what it's like to live in a world that is so, um, kind of mechanical whenever you're have this like rich inner life and are also kind of a stranger to this world um so it's really awesome um and the imagery is beautiful it reads more like a poem i think in in certain parts than a novel and i really loved it and um i would highly recommend it um and so that was the first book I read. I'm mm -hmm. so excited. I love that jacket too. It's beautiful. That's Isn't that amazing. Is it really gorgeous. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, I buy a yeah. lot of books based on the jacket. So <laughs> that's usually yes. not. I'm sure there are other people who do that too. Okay. And I love this jacket. The God Shot jacket is Isn't it amazing. Awesome. Great. It's yeah. It's stunning. Mm -hmm. um, so some of you may have heard of this book, God Shot by Chelsea Baker. Um, it's kind of a buzzy book right now in the, you know, like publishing world. I think I've seen it everywhere. Um, a few of my favorite authors um, were raving about it. And so I'm like, okay, I'll pick this up. Um, I ordered it from book people. <laughs> um, and I, oh my gosh, I am obsessed with this book. <laughs> I just finished it the other day. And when I put the book down, I like literally had goosebumps around my whole entire body. It's so <laughs> stunning. It's so good. So um, the book, um, it's published by Catapult. Um, I believe it's a debut novel as well, which I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe that. But um, so it is the story of this um, young woman, Lacey May, who lives in a town called Peaches in California and has kind of dedicated her life to this like, a uh, strange preacher man who believes that he is like, you know, like Jesus is like under him, but he's like kind of like the the savior. Um, and so she she and her family have kind of like been enveloped in this 
man who promises um, like water to this like drought ridden small town um, in California. Um, and, but it's mainly kind of this like really interesting in the way that um, the Book of X kind of spanned a lot of the main character's life. This one is like kind of this like very specific moment in her life when she was 14 to 15. Um, and the book um, is about like motherhood. It's about mother loss. It's about um, trying to like, you know, be, be a young woman while like being also told that like your only role in, in the world is to like help this church by um, like having children um, and kind of like what it's like to have a complicated relationship with your mother and then eventually become a mother yourself. Um, and it's just so incredibly stunning. I was, it, it like felt holy reading this. Like it was just like so good. Um, so I kind of like talk about it in hyperbole because I just love it so much. <laughs> um, but I hope that you pick it up. God shot. A lot of people I think will be talking about this. Um, and uh, if you, if you want to borrow it, let me know. <laughs> um, so I'll move on to the final book I have here, um, which is the Ice Cream Social Anthology Volume 2. Um, Ice Cream Social is a monthly feminist reading that takes place um, at Malvern Books. It hasn't lately, um, but typically every month um, a group of really wonderful women and non-binary writers get together to um, have an open mic. There's free tutor readers. Um, and I thought since someone in the chat earlier mentioned it's the last day of National Poetry Month, um, I love poetry so deeply. It's very close to my heart. Um, so I thought that this would be the perfect place to look for some inspiration and to look for some like light in this dark time. Um, so I'm gonna read a poem. Um, and this is um, published by Host Publications, which is a local publisher. Um, please purchase um, the book directly from them on their website. Um, help them out during this time, but um, I'll just read uh, this poem really quickly. I think it's really stunning. It's one of my favorite um, poems in the book and it's called Spooky Town by Annalise Gelman. Okay, Spooky Town. They scare me, the resin casts of men in flannel shirts and jeans, feet webbed unfeeling, the light that glances off the eyes, the knees. Wedded to the plastic grass they kneel in. It scares me. The grass is the kneeling with a new coat of paint. Everything is everything but shouldn't be. No wonder the men scream to be let out. No wonder I'm a spooky town and everything in me is trapped there, cast. And pacing the cage, not of its own making, but part and parcel, notwithstanding of the pacing. It scares me, the hand that does what hands do, waiting not without impatience in the candy, the hand that comes alive when you touch it with your hand. Spooky town, spooky citizen. And didn't they cut it off, the scientists, the dog's head? And didn't the blood pump through the machine like the machine was a body? Don't go in that house, we scream, that house is me. It's scary. And didn't they eat the candy? And couldn't the dog still notwithstanding see? And that's it. Ah, Kelsey, and you have a poem in that book too. Am I right? Yeah, I have a I have a short story in that's this book. That's right. Yeah. Now you'll see a familiar name. Yeah. Um, it is a horror short story um, that's very near and dear to me. So I felt I felt really happy to have it in a book like this. And you read that story the last time that we hosted the One Page Salon, I believe. I did. I did. <laughs> it's all coming full circle. One page of it. So we'll have to purchase it to, <laughs> to see how it ends. Oh, I actually was excited to read the rest of it when I bought that book. Um, yeah. So you're going to tell us about a few other people's suggestions. Yes. I'm so excited. Um, so as Sue A is reading... A Good Neighborhood by Therese Ann Fowler. 
Um, a good neighborhood, thought-provoking, emotional roller coaster ride, depicting crucial issues of class, racism, environmental concerns, conservative religion, birth love, and social interaction portrayed by well-drawn characters with their own secrets, agendas, hopes, and fears that collide in a stunning conclusion. That is a really awesome um right yeah <laughs> yeah I'm like oh my gosh wow um <laughs> I have not read it but I I would like to <laughs> um and so uh the next one is from Andrea N um if the Buddha dated I love that title um a hybrid of research self-development and memoir I think that this is the perfect kind of book maybe to pick up during this time um when we're all being a little um kind of introspective and thinking about some things um, all right, next we have a recommendation from Larry M. The Good Leads by Richard Cunningham, a familiar um, <laughs> name to the WLT family. Um, a historically accurate depiction of the global influenza crisis of 1918. Set in the Houston area, the story has eerily, eerie similarities to what's happening in the world today. Richard's protagonist raises the alarm on how the influenza can kill people and persistently make noise that business should not go on as usual. I haven't gotten there yet, but I can't wait to read what the Galveston Mafia has to say about that. <laughs> what? <laughs> that sounds wonderful. And Richard yeah. is such a great guy and member of the Writers League and on our board of directors and we're excited for him having that book out. So Yeah, that is so exciting. Congrats to Richard on that. Um, so next up we have a recommendation from Marion W. Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Um, the author manages to combine a searing indictment of South African apartheid and its aftermath with a tender, tragic, and yet humorous homage to his intrepid mother. Um, and Trevor Noah is uh, the host of The Daily Show, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So, I need to read this. I've heard great things about it, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. So I was yeah, I've been curious about it too. So this is this is putting that, that note in my brain. <laughs> um, next, we have a recommendation from Janice W., The Crown Lord by William Searles. Um, it is an alternate history, a picture of how things would look if things had been reversed in the Civil War. Pretty interesting. I always think it's interesting when, when books kind of flip the script like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Tony B. is reading <laughs> Zero Saints, by Gabino Iglesias, I believe. Uh, this book is a brain salad of horror, madness, and magical realism dressed in Latinx culture. Do not read this as you're drifting off to sleep like you even could. It's brutal in its beautiful redemption. Ooh. Uh, I can hear Tony B's voice when I lit when I read yeah. that. And he's he's always reading really interesting and cool books. So I love getting that recommendation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so some more ways to uh, pass the time. Um, I love this one. I'm thinking of shaving my head to see if I can grow another two feet of hair while in quarantine. <laughs> um, and then I'm reading five different books simultaneously, each in a different room of our house. My version of traveling, missing travel. I've, I've been sorting through old travel photos. It's, time in slow motion or is it just me what day is it march 61 2020 days seem long that is that is such a mood <laughs> well and we were talking about this the other day that it feels like that it felt to me like march flew march was really slow like march took forever and then april has flown by it's impossible to me that tomorrow is may 1st i can't believe it so i'm not sure what's going on guys but we're here for you we're here for each other we're gonna get through this <laughs> thank you kelsey <laughs> thanks samantha hi everyone um my name is sam babiak and i am the program director and member services director for the writers league of texas um i will mention that there's a trigger warning attached to the two books i'm about to talk about um they contain um sexual assault things so um before i get started i wanted to read a quote from megan garber um i found this in a review that she wrote for know my name um in the atlantic 
when trauma is transformed into art, there will always be a paradox. The art's existence is beautiful, but it shouldn't have to exist at all. Um, so, here we go. <laughs> so first, um, I'm going to talk about Know My Name by Chanel Miller. Um, so in 2016, a um, sexual assault case went viral, um, and that was the Brock Turner Stanford Summer. He uh, sexually assaulted a woman on the Stanford campus, um, and after he was sentenced to only six months in county jail, um, BuzzFeed published the Emily Doe, the victim's impact statement, and it went viral. And if you haven't read it, you can find it on BuzzFeed, and it is so powerful. It brought tears to my eyes. Um, but that later spurred um, Chanel Miller to reclaim her story and her, her name in Know My Name. And so this is her side of the story and exactly what happened, what she remembers. Um, and I think that this book is, it should be required reading for like every person on the planet, I think, um, mm -hmm. because it's just so powerful. And I think what is most powerful about it is the way that she takes you through the trial with her. And like, it really shows you how how horrible it is to not only be assaulted, but then to have to go through a trial where the system isn't made for you. And she shows how the system really empowers and enables abusers and continues to fail and silence victims. Um, and so just craft wise, like this is a blend between um, memoir and true crime. And she includes actual transcripts from the trial. So you get to see like firsthand exactly how the cross examinations go, like what Brock's statement is, like all of it. Um, and it's both like really heartbreaking and just like really difficult to read. It took me five months to read this book, um, but it is so, so powerful. And Chanel, I think, does a really beautiful job of setting scenes and doing, like, giving you all of the details you need to feel immersed in her story. And then she zooms out and she shows you, like, but this is a societal issue. And she just, she does an amazing, amazing job. Um, so everyone should read this book. I love that. I just want to say, I think you did a great job of describing it, so I don't really need to add anything, but <laughs> that I, I read that. Um, I read Know My Name pretty early after it was published, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's beautiful, and it's harrowing, and it's um, not just a retelling of what happened to her that night, but it's also the many, many, you know, months, if not years, that it took for all of that to sort of unfold and for it to finally, you know, have some sort of conclusion, however unsatisfying it was. So um, it's just, it's remarkable. And she's, and I think what was most remarkable to me is that she also is just a really beautiful writer. I mean, her prose is, is stunning. So I think for anyone out there writing memoir, if you're wondering, you know, how you might do it in a way that could be, um, even more compelling if you're looking for another memoir to read to add to your stack of stuff that you're reading as you're thinking about memoir this book is a great one to add to that so yeah and i'm gonna read one sentence from this book just one because that's all you need i think <laughs> um and this is shortly after the judge has sentenced brock to six months um and it's a lot longer than this it's a whole paragraph but i'm gonna read the last sentence my pain was never more valuable than his potential. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And so the next book I want to talk about is Things We Didn't Talk About When I Was a Girl by Jeannie Venasco. And I just started this book a couple of days ago, and I'm about 100 pages in. Um, so I'll just tell you what I know of the premise, and I'll go from there. And so Jeannie Venasco was sexually assaulted by a really good friend of hers, um, they had been friends when they met when she was 13. They were both in middle school um, and he assaulted her when she was 19. And 
this sort of recounts like the before and after um, their friendship before how he was really like one of her very best friends and then the after and the fallout of what happened. But what's like absolutely insane to me in this book is that she actually interviews him and she includes all of those interviews, all of the emails. Um, and so much like Know My Name, it's like this really interesting cross between memoir and true crime and journalism for this one especially. Um, and so, yeah, it's crazy. And I feel a lot of complicated things about including those interviews as well, but she really dives into the idea of believability and also the unreliability of our memories. So like for any memoirs, like this is something that you have to sort of reckon with that your memory might not be as accurate as you think it is. Um, and so part of what she's doing with the interviews is she's like, she's not only proving like, yes, this happened, but she's showing you like what it takes to prove that something has happened you know the the believability um of people who have like been assaulted um is something like it's a huge issue and she really does a good job in discussing that but also like she takes you through the writing process and so she literally like it's like you're writing this book with her in real time as she's deciding that she wants to call him that she wants to interview him and she talks about you know conversations with her editor talking about like well, what makes your, you know, assault special? Like, why is it something that you have to write about? Um, and so there's like no quotation marks in the book. Um, the chapters are really short and not in chronological order either. So structure wise, like it's really interesting, um, but it reads really fast. And so Know My Name took me like five months to read, but this one I'm almost halfway and it's only been two days. So mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and um. Yeah, so I'm going to read a very short section where she's talking about um, that idea of, like, her memory being inaccurate. Already, I feel the need to stop. If I botched some detail, was it a blackboard or a whiteboard? Did our physics teacher use a projector? I risk discrediting myself, and the nothing I say will be believed. If I construct memories through narrative, I risk making too many mistakes. I might unintentionally invent details in order to build a well-drawn scene and then another and another, accumulating scenes until they fit a clear plot structure. But I also don't want this to be an impressionistic series of images or abstract meditations on feelings. I want this to be artful, but the artistry can't interfere with the honesty. I'm not sure how to do this, but I know I want to do this. Let's just assume it was a blackboard. Um, uh -huh. So if you're writing a memoir and you're dealing with um, like the unreliability of your own memory, um, it's really interesting to see how she approaches this. And she'll literally like, she gives you a piece of like an email that he sent her and she'll write about her initial reaction to it, her feelings while reading it. And then she'll go on and she'll just dissect all of it and it's like you're like doing this in real time with her like you react initially and then you're like wait <laughs> maybe that wasn't like the thing that I should have said um but yeah she does a really fascinating like important and really good job at exploring like her own um experiences and victimhood in general yeah so that's what I've got <laughs> well and I just wanted to mention something that I said to you, Sam, when you brought up this book, which is another book that it reminds me of. And it's so, I love, I love when writers do this, which is really go back and examine, you know, talk to other people, do you almost like become a reporter in their own life. And she, or David Carr wrote a memoir called The Night of the Gun, which is also a really great and just very different memoir where David Carr uh, was a longtime journalist, a really, you know, impressive resume, but he had spent many years of his life as a drug addict. And he, he had a lot of things he didn't remember about his life. And he went back and interviewed his friends and interviewed people who were there to try to um, put together the real story. And it's just, um, I mean, for that reason alone, like this book sounds important for so many reasons. And there are and, and it sounds like a book that I imagine um, people are going to be talking about for a long time. 
but also for that craft piece of it, it sounds really interesting as well. So yeah, it's definitely really fascinating. And I did read some reviews of people saying that it felt really repetitive, but I feel like that mimics you know, the trauma that she's experienced and how you sort of like fall back into those patterns. But yeah, it's, it's really good. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. So Rhonda W. is reading The Art of the Wasted Day by Patric Patricia Hampel. Since we are currently hungered down and isolated, learning the art of wasting a day seems quite appropriate right now. It rambles a bit, but it is a wonderful read by a great writer who knows how to reflect on things that are difficult to express, but she gets it done. Mm. Sounds lovely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nancy B. is reading The Last Year of the War by Susan Meisner. It's about friendship and how freedom and friends can be unjustly taken away. As an old German-American woman begins her trip to visit a Japanese-American friend she made at the Crystal City internment camp here in Texas as a girl, we go back to her youth. Her life in Midwestern America was interrupted by the intermittent internment of her first of her father then her family because of who she is she loses her so-called friends but makes a new like unlikely friend who ultimately helps her survive life at the camp and a far more difficult and dangerous future mm -hmm. that's really interesting yeah claire m is reading what are people for by wendell berry <laughs> which is Short a great essay <laughs> yeah <laughs> short essays quick read berry's writing is superb mm -hmm. Leah F. is reading The Art of Memoir by Mary Carr. I actually just bought this book and it's on my nightstand right now. <laughs> um, it teaches what a memoir is in a poetic and fun manner with a language so rich and reality mixed with metaphors. Cool. I'm very excited to read. It was also recommended by Richard Santos like oh, wonderful. several weeks ago. <laughs> that's why I bought it in the first place. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Mm -hmm. Yes. Terrence W. is reading Black Chalk by Christopher J. Yates. The characters, plot, language. <laughs> That's all you need in a book, right? Pla characters, yeah. <laughs> plot, language. That's a great recommendation. <laughs> and some other ways to pass the time. Cooking, trying new recipes. You know all the weight I lost? It's back. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. My roommate's been experimenting with banana bread, and there's only two of us. <laughs> so we've been eating loaves of bread. Um, and I was writing my memoir and some poetry. Then I stopped. For two weeks, I watched the pandemic news in shock and disbelief. Then I registered for one of your classes and became a WLT member again. Like magic, I'm writing my poems and my memoir again. The WLT online creative writing classes have rescued me. Muchísimas gracias. Aw, <laughs> that's lovely. Oh boy, I was gonna say, it doesn't take a lot to experiment with banana bread. I mean, you're, you're just He's just baking. I think he's probably just baking banana bread at this point. He is. I mean, he's like, he's tested the foil, you know, versus no foil. <laughs> but yeah. Um, and that is a really um, great way to end is on a high note of thinking about baking and thinking about all the delicious foods we're eating. But, you know, we, we're doing it, guys. Nobody should be on a diet right now, in my opinion. Um, and then also just remembering that the Writers League is here for you. We are um, so happy to do events like this every week. And I hope you guys will keep coming back and that you'll check out the YouTube um, channel. But also please come to the One Page Salon. It is like nothing, no other reading event you've been to if you haven't been to it yet. And um, Owen Edgerton is a force and just one of the genuinely most um, supportive and cool and funny writers that we have here in Austin. And having these writers who are going to be reading um, this lineup is pretty special. And uh, I know that Amy is also going to be um, super fun to have there. So come to the One Page Salon. You'll be able to um, RSVP on our website, on our calendar, and you can also make a donation to Book Woman because, guys, we don't want to live in an Austin that doesn't have a Book Woman in it. So I hope that you'll make a donation whether you can be there on Saturday night or not, but I also hope you'll join us. And Thank you to all of you for showing up and we'll stick around. If you have any questions for us at all, I know there were some questions about the conference earlier um, in the chat box, but if you have any questions, feel free to linger and Kelsey and Sam and I will linger for a little bit and answer them. 
Um, and maybe we'll even throw up the, uh, the link in our chat box to the page where you can RSVP to the one page salon. Do you think someone could do that? <laughs> I guess I could find it. <laughs> but yeah, if you have any questions for us, let us know. Janice, hello. <laughs> We're glad that you enjoyed it. How can we donate to Book Woman if I can't make it on Saturday? You can do it through our website, which um, is one of the RSVP options, or you can also, I know that Book Woman has a direct um, button on their site where you can donate as well. But if you go to the Writers League site, um, hold on, I'm going to try to find it and throw it up there. You can also um, do it that way. Uh, any other questions? I'm finding where you can do it on our website. Oh, Kelsey did it. Yay. I found it. Thank you. <laughs> so click on that link and you'll just choose the donation um, optional link. But also guys know that we want everyone to come to this event. So if you know, we know a lot of people are um, also financially either just really tight right now or worried about the future or, you know, uh, some people without jobs. And so please know you can come to this event for free. You don't have to spend any money on it, but um, if you have it and you um, are interested, you can also make a donation. Hmm. Oh, thank you, Dwight. We're glad to have you here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll be, we'll be doing this every week. Let us know what you guys think we should do the next Ask Us Anything on, any topic under the sun that has to do with writing. <laughs> um, yeah, did you, and you know, for questions about publication, um, we do have a class coming up, right? We have Maud Ajarian is gonna teach a class on submitting to journals. So for anyone out there who's interested in, uh, thinking more about uh, submitting some of your short fiction or essays to journals, check that out on our website too. That class will be happening. You're welcome, Richard. We're excited for you and your book. Now I'm doing what you're not supposed to do, which is responding to the chat box without actually saying what's in the chat box. So everyone on YouTube who's watching this later will be, will be, <laughs> but, um, and Leah or Leah, I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly, but you're welcome. We're so glad to have you joining us. And I know that you're, I believe, um, in the San Antonio area. And so this is a great way for you to get to spend time with us. If not in person, then at least almost in person. So thanks for being here. <laughs> What's everyone doing this weekend? <laughs> One page. Reading, I, hope. <laughs> I mean, I have so many more books to read now that um, Kelsey, does that book that does that book that you were talking about? I think it was God Hit. Is that right? Does that have? Is there a lot of bees in there? Are there bees in there? Bees in the book? Are those bees on the cover, or am I wrong? No. Um, yeah. So <laughs> it's um, glitter, actually. Oh, it's glitter. I thought it was a bunch of bees. Yeah. I was thinking it was um, so cool. I know. Isn't oh, God? I am obsessed with this cover. I really am. Yeah. But um, it's it's actually within the book. Anytime there's like a scene where all of the characters are in the church and peaches with this like man named Vern who thinks he's like God. There's always somebody in the top rafter that like, um, like kind of sprinkles this golden glitter onto everybody. Um, and everyone's convinced that it's like holy, but actually it's just kind of like that would get old real fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it'd be hard to get out of your hair. You know what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> it, it just seems like a hassle. Especially if Peaches is going through a drought. And how are people going to wash that out of their hair? If they, I know. Don't, they don't wash water. themselves. Uh, oh. They don't have any water. I and know. And they're throwing, just throwing that glitter on top of them. It's yep. very frustrating for me. Um, but no, it sounds wonderful. That book does for it's sure. So good. Who are the writers that you admire that recommended it? Um, 
the number one, my girl, T. Kara Madden, Sam knows. Um, <laughs> I have to read it too. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. You have to read it. She actually, T. Kara Madden did an event with Chelsea Beaker. Um, I think for books are magic in New York. Is that uh, the bookstore? Anyway, yeah. I, I was really excited to go to this event and realized because it's in New York, I got the time wrong and it was already done by the time I went to Zoom. It's okay. I'm not mad about it, but <laughs> um, so T. Kira Madden's the author of Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, which is ah, that's one of my favorite on deck for yeah, sure. One yeah. of my favorite memoirs I've ever read. And so she's been posting about it on social media. And I'm like, if T. Kira's talking about it, I'm going to read it. Um, and I'm glad I did. And uh, she says in her blurb that it's an absolute masterpiece. And I'm like, it's true. It's very good. <laughs> like we got Tony Burnett asking a question. I think Tony Burnett. Um, someone named Tony, perhaps Burnett. Uh, is there a phone number that works right now? Well, we, uh, yeah, you can email Sam direct. <laughs> and we uh, also are checking the phone messages, but we're just checking them more. Um, less often because the message tells people to just email us directly. So, but we can get you, we can hook you up. We can help you out. Reach out to Sam. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Mm, now we're just staring at each other. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Well, if no one has any more questions, we might, um, you know, get back to reading, get back to our reading areas, our respective reading areas. But it's been fun hanging out with you guys. And um, yeah, you have a good evening too. And we saw your suggestions, Dwight. So we'll definitely um, see what we can do about some of those other topics. And um, thank you, Amanda. We're glad to have you. And join us on Saturday if you can. And hopefully we'll see you guys soon. Okay. Take care. Have a great night. <laughs> <You too. laughs>